events from this morning for those of you who were providentially hindered from being here despite your best efforts to make it and for the rest who were here but didn't hear anything that was said. <laughs> Galatians 6 verse 1, brethren, brethren, so the Holy Spirit's addressing saved people. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Father, bless your word to our hearts tonight. Make us willing to receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if I review what we said this morning in just five minutes, you'll wonder why it took me more than five minutes to say it this morning. But according to verse 1, a fault is something that is pursuing you and is liable to overtake you at some time or another during your Christian life. According to James chapter 5, the cross-reference to which we went this morning, a fault is not a sin. It is a defect in our character, in our personality, in our makeup, in our flesh. And we are to confess our faults one to another. Never our sins. You can't trust men with your sins. And they couldn't do anything to deliver you from them or or give you victory over them anyway. But faults are another matter. And we saw that we are to confess our faults one to another so that we can be of assistance one to the other when these uh, faults begin to overtake us. We also saw that uh, burdens are not sins, but they are uh, just the, the necessary, uh, according to God's deal in our lives, they are the necessary events of, of this life. It may have to do with what we are by nature. They may have to do with experiences of our life. They may have to do with temporal matters or circumstances. But these are the things that weigh us down. And we'll illustrate that from the Bible in just a moment. And then we, we need to consider from verse 1, ye which are spiritual. And then he says, consider thyself lest thou also be tempted. And the implication of that verse is you might be spiritual today. And tomorrow you might be the one who has been overtaken by a fault. So while you are up, you need to help the one who is down, because tomorrow you may well find yourself the one who is down in need of the one who on that day is up. And that's why it's important to continue in regular, consistent faithful fellowship with people that are trying to live the Christian life because you are not always going to be on top of things. And we'll illustrate that in just a moment, Lord willing. So, in verse 2, we are to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill uh, the law of Christ. And we cleared up the misconception uh, from from uh, careless and, and uh, modern preaching that if you come to Jesus, He'll take your burdens away. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2 that Christ bore our sins. It's not a Bible doctrine that Jesus bears or take your, takes your burdens away. In fact, Matthew 11:28 says that trusting Jesus and living for Jesus and following Jesus will bring into your life a whole new set of burdens and things to be, uh, to de- to be dealt with and to be concerned about. Uh, then, according to verse number 3, uh, we, we learned that we should not deceive ourselves, every one of us is beset by faults, and every one of us is weighed down by burdens. There are no exceptions. If you think you've got it all together and think you've got it all figured out, you deceive yourself. You don't deceive anybody else. Uh, Nobody, listen, the the fellow that's just so full of uh, spiritual pride and conceit, uh, he's the only one that shares his high and lofty opinion of himself. Everybody else has got it got it figured out. 
Uh, then according to verse number four, your victories will uh, by and large be enjoyed by only you and your defeats will by and large uh, be suffered uh, only by you. In verse five, every man shall bear. That's that's ongoing. Every man shall bear his own burden. What we saw and learned this morning is that these defects and these faults and these uh, these situations that we find ourselves uh, facing Uh, are lifelong battles and struggles. You are not going to be free from your faults until you leave this world. You're not going to be free from from burdens until you leave this world. And so the admonition this morning was to do three things. Find out what what your defective areas are. Confess them to your brothers and sisters in Christ and allow the the saints to help you with your areas of weakness. That was, that was our uh, message for this morning. Now, I want to go to Hebrews 8 just for a minute and, and illustrate for you and reinforce for you this, this doctrine that we set forth this morning from Galatians and from James, that faults are not necessarily sins, but rather they are matters of weakness. We, we, Use the illustration from nature of the San Andreas Fault running through California, that defect in the crust of the earth, that, that breach, if you will, in the earth's uh, uh, composition uh, that causes harm and causes trouble. It's not a sin, but it certainly results in some things that are, are very hurtful. Now, in Hebrews 8, the Bible says this, starting at verse number uh, 7. Hebrews 8, starting at verse 7. Starting at verse 6. But now he, Jesus Christ, now hath he, Jesus Christ, obtained a more excellent ministry. Now look, a more excellent ministry, the wording implies the ministry he has replaced was excellent. But his is more excellent. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. So the first covenant was good, but this one's better, which was established upon better promises. First covenant had promises, very wonderful promises. These are better. Okay, you see that. There's nothing wrong with the first, but the second is an improvement. It's, it's better in, in three particulars, right? Verse 7. For if that covenant, that first covenant, we're referring to what? The Old Testament that God Almighty made with the children of Israel. Anything wrong with that covenant? Come on, that's God's Word to man. That's God Almighty speaking from heaven, giving Moses His words on the tables of stone. That's a good thing. Nothing wrong with that covenant, but the Bible says, for if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them... He saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Now, look at this. That first covenant, God, not the devil, God, not man, God, not a religion, God took the children of Israel by the hand and led them out of Egyptian bondage. Isn't that a good thing? God took them through the Red Sea and and He's going to transport them by His power into the promised land. Isn't that a good thing? Along the way, God gives them His Word upon the Holy Mount. God spake with Moses face to face and gave him the law. Isn't that a good thing? But, because its full enjoyment depended upon the weakness and unprofitableness of the flesh of that Israelite nation, the covenant was found to be faulty, not sinful. But faulty, it was defective, it had an inherent weakness that caused it to be something less than the best. You see that? Now, here I am. God, by His grace, has saved me from my sin. 
God, by His own right hand, has brought me out of a lost condition and into a saved condition, and I'm on my way to the promised land. Isn't that great? But with my salvation, with the indwelling Holy Spirit, with eternal life, with the inerrant Scriptures in my hands to read and to live by, there is something faulty in this whole situation. It's me. If I don't sin, I'm faulty. When I'm not transgressing, I'm faulty. When I'm doing the best I can do, I am defective. I am limited in my ability to be all that God wants me to be. I'm limited in my ability to be all I want to be for God. I'm limited in my ability to obey the scriptures I know and to serve the God I love because it's, I'm just not up to the task. That's not sin. That's the reality of life in a mortal body with an Adamic nature. Even if you're saved and born again, you are just not up to it. There's something in me that on my best day leaves me short of the mark. There's something about you. There are things that are part of who we are and who we'll be till we leave this world that stand in opposition to what God is trying to do in our lives. Those are faults. Those are defects. That is why God did not tell you. He never told you to live this Christian life in isolation to live this Christian life outside of, of proper fellowship, to live this life independently within proper fellowship. Because none of us are what we need to be to live the Christian life as God wants us to live it and as we want to live it when our hearts are, are inclined towards the Lord. So I need you to pray for and to help me with my faults. And you need me to pray for and to help you with your faults because they're not going away. Now, let's, let's take another look at this matter of burdens. Let's illustrate, biblically illustrate, burdens. Come to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. Bible says, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Okay? So, that's what you are tonight. You're an, you're an earthen vessel. Some of your speed boats, some of your cruise liners, some of your tugboats, some of us are barges, but we're, we're vessels. And we're not hauling coal or ore or tin or lumber, we're hauling treasures. That's pretty good, isn't it? We have treasures in these earthen vessels. They hold uh, lumber and ivory and peacocks and all that stuff up to Solomon, and some of those ships of Ophir brought gold. That's what we are. We're the, we're the vessels hauling the gold, man. We've got treasure in these earthen vessels. Look at Acts chapter 21. The Bible says it came to pass... That after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course unto Coos, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence to Patara. Now, look at the picture of, of, of the life of a saved person who really loves God and wants to do right. You know what that vessel's made for? It's made for carrying stuff. And this vessel has launched, I hope you have, and it's sailing straight, and I hope you are. See that? Verse, verse number two. And finding a ship sailing over unto Phoenicia, we went aboard, set forth. Now, when we had discovered Cyprus, we left it on the left hand, and sailed into Syria, and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unlade her, her burden. Now, this ship isn't carrying sin. This ship is carrying what the Bible calls burden. You know, what the, you know what a burden does to a ship? It slows it down. You know why it slows it down? 
because it causes it to sit down lower in the water. And as it sits down lower in the water, there's more resistance to its motion. There's more opposition to its motion. There's more drag upon that vessel. Not only that, it's harder to steer that thing properly because if it's full of burden and it gets headed the wrong direction, its momentum is going to tend to keep it going the wrong direction. So it's a, it's a dangerous thing for a ship that's burdened to get off course just a little bit because it's inclined to just keep on I'm going off course. Now, isn't that a perfect picture, biblically, of what burdens are in your life? They're not sins, but they'll sure slow you down. They're not sins, but they'll sure weigh upon you and, and, and hinder your motion and create more resistance to your movement. And those burdens, if you get off just a little bit to the right and a little bit to the left, they will tend to exaggerate the improper direction in which you're heading. So what's the Bible say? Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What's my, what's my responsibility to you as a brother? It's to help you unload your vessel. Not add to it. Help you unload it. What's your responsibility as a brother or sister in Christ toward me? Not to weigh me down with another burden, but to help me unload the burdens that I've got. What should be the purpose of our fellowship? Unloading vessels so they can sail faster, sail lighter with less resistance and opposition, be easier to steer and to direct. Now, we're not, none of this is about sin. I can't take your sin away. You can't take my sin away. But I could, I certainly should, as a husband, be helping my wife to be less burdened. And a wife should be helping her husband to be less burdened. And parents and children should be helping one another to be less burdened. That, that's our, our duty and obligation toward one another. That's the law of Christ. Now, turn to 2 Corinthians. Well, no, I'll tell you what. Before we go there, Acts 15. Acts 15, while we're right here. Acts 15, on this matter of burdens. This great council takes place in Acts chapter 15. 2,000 years ago, it was settled that works play no part in salvation. And that the Old Testament law was in no way binding upon New Testament Christians. And 2,000 years later, 90% of the people went to church this morning still don't have those two things figured out. Just shows that it's a waste of time for God to give us a Bible if you're not going to pay attention to it. But they come out of this council and they determine that we're not under the law. Those of us that were saved from Gentile nations never were under it to start with, so why get under it now? And those of us that were saved out of the nation of Israel, we've been under it all our lives and couldn't keep it. We're crazy to think we can keep it now. So let's just thank God that it was nailed to the cross with Jesus and be free of it once for all, finally, and forever. Praise God. Now, remember when I said this morning, and some of you are still a little iffy about it, I showed you from Matthew eleven twenty-eight that living for Jesus can create burdens that you would not have if you weren't living for Jesus. You understand, if you weren't trying to live by the Bible, if you weren't in fellowship with people trying to live, live by the Bible, there wouldn't be anybody living on the face of the earth that would care what you watched or what language you used or what you wore or where you went. Nobody would care. It wouldn't matter because you're just part of the broad flow of humanity racing toward the pit of hell. And it, who cares? But now you are saved and everything that you do matters to the Lord and to the testimony of His church. That's an increased burden. That's why most people we lead to the Lord don't come to church here. They don't want the added burden of trying to live for Jesus. Now watch, I'll show it to you in the Bible. Look at Acts 15 and start at verse number uh, 23. They wrote letters by them after this manner, introduced themselves. 24, here's the problem. 
25, here's the conclusion. Verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, and to keep yourselves, uh, for from which ye keep yourselves ye should do well, fare ye well. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, so on and so forth. Now, come back earlier in the chapter. Look at verse 21. Why did they come to this conclusion? For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So here's what they said. We are not under the law. We don't have to keep the law. But the cities you're going to go and witness, where, where you're going to go and preach the gospel, they think it's a horrible crime against God to eat blood. So we're going to put this burden on you. Don't eat blood. The cities where you go, they think... Uh, because Moses has been taught there, they think and they believe that it's a horrible crime to buy something in the marketplace that's been strangled and eat it for supper. So we're going to put this burden on you. Don't ruin your testimony by eating something that they think is uh, uh, that only a, a, a horrible heathen would eat. Now look, it's nothing eat anything God made, according to the Bible. Well, if it's not a sin, why can't I eat it? Well, because it's part of your testimony. Oh, man. So you know what that is? That's a burden. That's something imposed upon you by Jesus that is not a matter of sin or righteousness, but it's just a matter of wanting to do your best for God. So here's what the Bible says. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay? So, I need you to encourage me and and continually remind me that it's worthwhile to go the extra mile for Jesus Christ, even though the world and most of the professing Christians in the world are trying to tell me to stop living right. It is a burden to me. It is a burden to you to sell out and live your whole life for Jesus Christ and for others. Let's just be honest about it. That's a burden. You are dealing things in your life you wouldn't have to deal with if you were just a carnal, worldly, let the world go to hell and couldn't care less, professing Christian with no testimony and no desire to win the lost. Trying to do right increases the burden, the weight that you're holding in this vessel, the resistance and the drag that's placed upon you. If you live in the lot of you drive in from other places, if you live in the land, your life would be easier if we didn't preach on the street. Your life would be easier if you didn't go to that church where we shoot people who watch TV and cut the right arms off of women that don't wear four layers of dresses down two feet past their ankles. I wish we were as strict and straight and holy as the people out there say we are. Well, you don't want to go to that church. Those people have to read the Bible four hours a day or their pastor kills them. (laughs) I know six people that they've executed down there. All that talk. You know, if you didn't witness, you wouldn't get ridiculed. If you didn't try to live right, try to do right, try to stay separated, you wouldn't get made fun of. So it increases the burden, right? So what are we to do? Not keep dumping on each other, but to get together and say, Brother, I appreciate what you're doing. I'm I'm glad I'm with you. I'm glad you're with me. I'm glad to have some help in this thing. I'm glad you're praying for me. Come on, we, we need to continually remind each other. This is the right way to go. This is the right life to live. Get out there passing out tracts. Who comes up and gets in your face and tells you not to be doing it? It's not lost people. I'm saved. 
I love the Lord, and I don't see why you're doing this. You know why you don't see why? Because you got both eyes shut and sewn shut. That's why. I mean, I could show you in about 30 seconds from the Bible why we're doing it, but you don't want to see it. Save people. Well, let's see, why, when are you going to go three times a week for me? You can, be, you can be just as close to God. I mean, I only go once a month, and when I go, I don't even listen. And I, you know, I read a book, and, you know, I'm just there to gossip anyway, and, and I'm just as close to God as they are. So, well, yeah, I know, but I could show you why you have no testimony, but you don't want to see it. Look, I don't need that. Believe it or not, there's something inside me that doesn't want to do this. There's something inside me that doesn't want to surrender to Jesus. There's something inside me that doesn't want to take on that world. If they want to go to hell, let them go. There, there's something inside me that could quit tomorrow. I don't need you to encourage that guy. <laughs> He strengthens himself. He wakes up before I wake up. He's waiting for me at the foot of the bed. I need you to encourage the, the one that wants to bear this burden. I need you to help me, not make it lighter, but just help me bear it. Man, I'll tell you what, the, the fellow that, that discipled me after I got saved, and he only discipled me because he had to, because I wouldn't stay away. Here's what he said every day. He said, watch out for the Christians. Watch out for the Christians. Watch out for the Christians. He said, if you ever stop, it'll be because of Christians. It won't be because of the world, it'll be because of Christians. And he was prophesying about himself. Because he came the closest to knocking me out of this thing of anybody. And I, listen, we could support every missionary that's ever come through here full support if every Christian ever tried to discourage me from living for Jesus and giving me a dollar at the same time. So we need to recognize that everybody here who's trying to do something for Jesus is under a burden because of it. And we need to help them bear that burden by encouraging them to go on. I don't want to be part of that crew that shows up around here and everybody they hang out with ends up sinking to the bottom. I want to be part of that group that everybody they hang around with keeps going. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, Second Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Help one another with our faults. Help one another with our burdens. I told you this morning, I reviewed it this evening, that you'll never get to that place where you got it all together. You'll never get to that place where you, you got it all figured out. Total victory. 2 Corinthians 4. And verse 7. If we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power of uh, of the power may be of God and not of us. All right, now, Paul, it, would, would, would anybody here disagree with me? Apostle Paul, far as we know, is probably the finest Christian ever lived. I, I don't know who you'd put up against him as any better. Uh, Wesley would have been up there, right up there with him. Um, but uh, we'll find out the judgment seat of Christ, the greatest Christian ever lived. It's probably some little fellow in a jungle somewhere you never heard of. But as far as we know, as far as we got record, Paul's probably the top. Okay, I'm just going to read you some words about the Apostle Paul, starting at verse 8. Troubled, perplexed, cast down, bearing about, dying, verse 11, death. Woohoo! Give me a double dose. Now, let me, let me say this politely and, and nicely so you won't be offended. These TV preachers, they're just liars. That, that's, that's nice. See, that's, 
Well, it's not very nice. Oh, you should have heard what I could have said. That was nice. The saved life. You don't get saved and then, woohoo, trouble's gone. Woo, perplexity's gone. Woo, despair's gone. Woo, never bought him out again. That's not life. God never offered you that. He never promised you that. He never even held that out as a possibility. Let's read it. Verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Now, you ready? I'm going to say again what I said this morning. I want you to get this. You have all these problems. And you come to Jesus and He saves you. Now you are a saved person with all these problems. They don't go away. And you can do one of two things. You can allow those problems to ruin your new life in Christ like they ruined your old life out of Christ. Or you can enable the ministry of Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the saints to give you victory over those troubles and problems. They are not going away. You can defeat them or they can defeat you, but they are not going away. And the minute you think you've outrun them, they will overtake you. So you've got to learn to deal with these things. People come to God, oh God, take it away. Oh God, take it away. Oh God, take it away. Right up front, get it. He's not going to take it away. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to comfort you. He's going to enable you. He's going to preserve you. He is going to help you. You know why all those promises the Bible? Because you're going to need it. Why would you need all that if you didn't need all that? <laughs> Isn't that profound? The Holy Spirit's called the Comforter. And the Lord said, the Comforter will abide with you forever. What could that mean but that all the way through I'm going to need comfort? See, see well, we want this Christianity that you put in the microwave. And it spins around for a minute, gets radiated, and then pops out and, oh, it's all done. Christian life isn't like that. Long, slow process. And you're going to walk it or you're going to drop out. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I can prove it to you from the Bible. Say you think if I prayed hard enough, prayed long enough, and all my hang-ups would disappear, and all my weaknesses would become strengths, and all my little problems and phobias and mental twitchings and everything, God had straightened them all out. And that, listen, the longer I'm saved, the worse they get. They, don't, they get worse. They do. Because where you used to be, you know, cranky, now you're old and forgetful and cranky. And it just multiplies the thing. I got these, I, I kid you not, I've got places in my in my mine now and it's it scares me i'm just being honest with you scared they're just they're they're blank somebody has just erased parts of my brain i go looking for stuff and it's just gone i open the drawer and there's nothing there i mean it man somebody's robbing me and i sit and i look at 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 at, you know, 20 years ago, I could, I could memorize a, read a book and memorize it. And then 30 years ago, I could remember what book to go to and where to go in the book. And I don't even remember what book it was or who I loaned it to. And I'll, I'll look at somebody. It's like the Lord at the day of judgment. I never knew you. I, I, it's, <laughs> the face is familiar, but your name, I, and that, you know, you probably just try to say, well, you know, that's just how it is. That scares me. 
I've, I've ministered to, to saints that the whole file cabinet was empty. And they loved God and lived for God and served God. But one day they woke up and they were in the company of the feeble-minded. I don't want to wake up that way. That troubles me. i got things trouble me. I know what troubles you. The things bother me. I don't want to lose my testimony. I know better than men than I have lost it. So you've got to get over this thing of thinking, one day I'm going to have it all together and then it'll be easy. You're never going to have it all together. One day I'm going to, I'm going to go over this hill and on the other side of that hill it's going to be free from all these troubles and trials and temptations and burdens and then the Christian life will all be easy. You don't get over that hill till they put a marker over you. So watch this thing. Verse 7. This is Paul writing again. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. He prayed and asked God to take it away. Why? It was weighing his boat down. It was causing him to sit low in the water. It was increasing the drag and the resistance on his vessel. He said, God, unload this thing. (laughs) And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect by taking away your weakness. That's not what it said, is it? My strength is made perfect in weakness. See, that's a burden. I don't like that. I don't want to be strong in weakness. I want to to be in a situation where I don't have to be strong. Right? Isn't that what we want? I don't want God to enable me to deal with this. I don't want this to have to deal with. I want heaven now. See, I want, God to, I want God to fix this earth and this life up so much that I don't want to go to heaven. I just want to take all the thrill and all the hope and all the anticipation out of it. I want it right now. I want everything Benny Hinn said I could have. Come on, man. If that guy was telling the truth, I'd follow him. But he's not. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, not me. In reproaches, not me. In necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Now, that's why I say he's a better Christian than me. Because he took all these things... And saw them as opportunities for God to work in his life. I look at all these things and I see them as stuff I wish wasn't happening. Just being honest with you. Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. All we're doing tonight is illustrating this morning's message. You will not be free from your burdens in this life. Your burdens are not sin. They're things that weigh you down and... Make your journey more difficult. Faults are not sins. They are defects. Weaknesses. We're to bear one another's burdens. We're to confess our faults one to another. Pray for one another. We, we may be healed of these, of these faults. Now Ecclesiastes 1. Great principle of life. Starting at verse number 5. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteneth to his place where he arose. And the longer you live, the hastener it gets. Sun comes up, sun goes down. Sun comes up, sun goes down. Sun comes up, sun goes down. See that? Okay? Look at verse number 6. The wind. 
goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. So, the sailing ships, they go south from Europe to the Caribbean, and then they go north from America back to Europe. And then the jets, they fly this away, going west, and that away going east. You say, why? Because that wind goes out and then circles back, and goes out and then circles back, and goes out and then circles back. Long before NASA and satellites and Christopher Columbus and all the rest of that, it's right here in the Bible. Okay, verse 7. All the rivers run into the sea, and yet the sea is not full. Under the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Rain falls down, washes out the itsy bitsy spider, <laughs> runs, <laughs> runs down to the river, river runs down to the ocean, water evaporates up into the clouds, goes back over the mountains, washes out the spider again, down the river, back into the ocean, and that water just goes around and around and around. Amen. Now look at verse 3. What profit hath a man of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun? What's the lesson? Your life goes up, and your life goes down. And your life goes up, and your life goes down. And your life goes up, and your life goes down. And you're in the flesh... And then the wind blows and you're in the spirit. And then you're back in the flesh. And then the wind blows and you're in the spirit. And then you're back in the flesh. And then the wind blows and you're in the spirit. Okay? And then there's great victory. And then there's great defeat. And then there's, this is great. I love the Lord. I'm rolling now. And then you're back down to earth. And then it's, boy, Brother James really preaching great. Oh, he really stinks. Oh, I love my church. Oh, I'm sick of my church. Oh, they're great people. Oh, they're all a bunch of rats. Look, that's life under the sun. You're not always going to be good. I'm not always going to be good. Church is not always going to be good. Serving Jesus is not always going to be good. And sometimes it's great and you can't figure out how it got so great. And sometimes it's horrible and you can't figure out how it got so horrible. And listen, it's going to turn. As, as high as you are and you think you're going to stay there, you're coming down. And as low as you are and you think you'll never get out of it, you're going to come up. So, what's the purpose of fellowship? somebody's going to be up when you're down. Somebody's going to be in when you're out. Somebody's going to be excited when you're losing interest. And you got to hang in there and let them know you need help so they can help you. Because the next time around, they're going to need help and you'll be there to help them. And that's why when people get down, get discontented, get sour, get bitter, and they drop out of fellowship, they never get in. They never get back in and go on. Because they miss the opportunity to see God's strength made perfect in their weakness. Man, don't run away when it gets bad. Run closer. Don't turn away from us when you need us. Turn to us. Having trouble with your children? There's plenty of people here who aren't. Don't hide it. Get some help. Having trouble in your marriage? Plenty of people here with a good marriage. Don't hide it. Get some help. Struggling with this or that or that thing in your Christian life? There's people here who got victory over it. Don't hide it. Get some help. Because one day that thing will be turned around. And, and, and what about sinks their boat? You'll be dragging them down. You'll be able to come along and help them unload some of that cargo like they did for you. That's the purpose of Christian fellowship. This is not the place where perfect people get together and gloat over their perfection. 
It's a place where imperfect people get together and help one another with their imperfections. And instead of pretending to be perfect, you need to go ahead and join up with those of us that aren't so we can help you. How about that? Romans 15. Romans 15. You know, it's a blessing as a, as a pastor. You've been able to have somebody come and say, Well, James, I got this thing in my life. It's just, I can't get any victory over it. It's messing me up. I don't see any way anybody could ever get the victory over this thing. And they say, Bro, and, and they say Okay, um, just give me a couple of days. And to go to somebody in this church that has gotten victory over that very thing and say, Can I put you together with this? Man, can I put you together with this woman? And can I, can I let you minister to them and, and show them how God gave you the victory over that thing? That's what we're here for. I've not had every problem, but you put us all together and collectively we just about had them all. I've not won every victory, but you put us all together and collectively we've just about won every victory. So we can... Bear one another's burdens. You can be the sunrise for somebody else's sunset. You can be the east wind for somebody else's west wind. You can be the, the catching up for somebody else's falling down. You, you see what, what God has in mind here? All right, Romans 15. Romans 15. Verse number 1. We then that are strong, okay, in your time of strength, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Not the sins. Only Jesus bear your sins. It's your weaknesses, your defects, your burdens, your faults. We, we then are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. You know, it's easy when things are up and things are going good just to leave all those people that aren't spiritual alone. <laughs> Look at that. Well, if they were right with God, they wouldn't be doing that. Because I don't do it. You better, you better watch what you say. Your turn's coming. Your little thorn in the flesh is coming. So when you're up, you all help somebody's down. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good, to edification. Now look at this. For even Christ please not himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. See, whenever, whenever you get reading the Bible, you always say things that just don't sound right, but they're right. Christ, please not himself. You see that? Okay? Honestly. Honestly. If Jesus had a choice between being spit on by men or praised by seraphim, he would prefer the praise of the seraphim. Okay? If it's a choice between bearing my sin and his body on the tree or sitting at the right hand of his father, never having any interaction with man's transgression. It was preferable to sit at the right hand of the Father. I didn't say he didn't love us. I didn't say that he, he didn't want us to be saved. I didn't but I know he knelt in that garden and when he when he looked into that cup and saw my sin, he lifted his tear stained face up to his father and said, Is there any way around this? And when the father said there wasn't, he went through with it. But it wasn't pleasing. Love compelled him to do what wasn't pleasant for the benefit of someone else. You young men in Bible school, and you uh, fellows that are praying about God using you in a, in a larger scale, if all you want to do is go out there and do what you want to do, don't go. If all you want to do is go out there and enjoy the parts of the ministry that are pleasant, 
Stay out of it. But if you're willing to do what's not pleasant because you love others and it's better for them, then we need you. That's what we need. We need people to put others first, not themselves. And who are willing to do what's not pleasant because they want to emerge so fulfill the law of Christ. There's the law of Christ. I'd rather, I'd rather not get involved in this. I'd rather not know about this. I'd rather not have to deal with this. I know how it's going to turn out. I'm going to say what the Bible says. I'm going to give the Bible instruction. I'm going to do the best I can. and be hated for it, lied about, accused. But in the long run, it's going to turn out okay. If we go ahead and stand right here, you got to do that. You got to do that. There's people in town, some of you run into the last couple of weeks, they just, they just absolutely hate everything about this place. Because we tried to save their marriage or their reputation or their children. You know what? It would have been easier to just let them go off the cliff and not even try to stop them. There's burdens that come along with trying to do right. about you, it's about you, you don't help. If it's about others for Christ, you try to help. Okay? Now, here's what I want you to see from this material. The fact that I'm a pastor doesn't put me in any separate category. I'm down like you're down. I mess up like you mess up. I've got my faults like you got your faults. I got my burdens like you got your burdens. When you demand that I not be like everybody else who's ever been saved and part of the body of Christ, you put me in a you, you create for me a set of expectations that I can't measure up to and I'm going to make you angry or disappoint you because I can't meet that expectation because it's not realistic. It's not a biblical expectation. You cannot have a pastor that's everything you want him to be. you got a guy that's as big a mess as you are. This is just a spot God gave me in the body of Christ. And as a pastor, I can't... Well, I can because I do... I can't quit just because after 20 years of hammering away at the same nail, it's still isn't in the board. Because you've got the same hang-ups I got. You've got the same weaknesses I got. You've got the same defects I've got. And the best we can do is those of us that are up can keep the ones that are down going. And then when that thing turns, then there's another group that's up, and they can keep the ones of us that are down going. We just live in this little um, manufactured home. At the time it was a trailer, but now it's a manufactured home. Aren't all homes manufactured? <laughs> anyway, we live in this trailer. And it was on a little, uh, uh, on a beautiful lake. Actually, it was on a half acre pit that was dug to get the trailer up high enough so it wouldn't flood. Manufactured housing on lakefront property sounds better than a trailer on a mud pond. <laughs> but anyway, that's where we lived. And these fire ants got in the yard, as they tend to do. And you spray them, and you andro them, and you set them on fire, and you take the hose and flood them, and I mean, all they do is multiply. They're amazing. They really are. So I thought I'd, one day I thought I'd drown them. So I'd, I'd take big shovelfuls, and I'd throw them as far as I could out in that pond. I don't belong to Peter or Greenpeace or any of those people. We took six billion years to get to the top. We're going to enjoy it while we're here, so... 
survival of the fittest till something comes along and can knock us off our perch. We're just going to rule right here. So. <laughs> That's right. That's right. One day we're all going to be slaves to talking apes, so you better enjoy this while you can. But, uh, no, I just, I just, I just, <laughs> yeah. A- anyway, I got watching that, and it's amazing what these fire ants would do. They would swim to each other, and they would form balls of fire ants. And then they would start turning so that half were underwater, nearly drowning, while the other half were breathing, getting air, and then they'd rotate, and the other half that had air went underwater, and the ones that had been underwater came up and got air, and they kept doing that until they made their way all the way back to the shore. It's incredible. Those things are smarter than your dog that can read the newspaper and talk and all that. I mean, they're, they're, they're smart. I don't, know how, I don't know where they learn that. Well, it would, um, anyway. <laughs> and I watch those things, and, and as I'm watching that, I'm thinking, you know what? Individually, if they'd try to get to shore, they'd all drown. But they drew close to one another. And they clung to one another. And they helped one another. And the ones on top ministered to the ones on the bottom. The ones on the bottom ministered to the ones on the top. And they just kept reciprocating that until they all made it back safe. Man, that's really, the Bible says, consider the ant. Individually, they're not a one of us going to make it. But closer we can cling to one another and help one another, assist one another, and make up for one another's weaknesses and and troubles, there's a chance we can all be victorious in this great trial of being tossed into the mud pond by the crazy man that lives in the trailer. I'm just telling you, every, every one of you has got situations in your life that feel that out of control. And the best thing you can do is get close as you can to the brethren. Close you can to your sister. You're going to need them. And here's what you've got to get over. I, I touched on this a little bit this morning. I'll, I'll say it tonight, and then I'll be through. But you've got to get over this thing of nobody can help me because nobody else is going through what I'm going through. And you, t- you tell somebody, well, yeah, but... But mine happened on Tuesday and yours was Wednesday, so mine's worse. Listen, what you're going through is always worse than what anybody else has gone through because it's you. What I'm going through is always worse than what you've been through because it's me. But the truth of the matter is, the Bible principles, if they're true, then everybody is going through something. And don't despise the people that have victory and push them away and say, you couldn't know what I'm going through or you wouldn't be enjoying life. The truth of the matter is, there are some people who go through these things and still enjoy life and they're the ones that can help you. The ones that are going through these things and don't have any victory, that's not where you want to go. Why, man, why are you hanging out with those losers? Well, because they're the only ones that understand me. No, you're wrong. The people that have victory understand you too. They just let Jesus get them through it. Those are the people you need to get the help from. My name's Joe. I've got a problem. I've had this problem for 48 years. I'm always going to have this problem. Hi, Joe, I'm, I'm Tom. I used to have that problem, but I don't anymore. Oh, you couldn't have. No, I really did. No, it wasn't as bad as mine. No, I'm telling you, it was worse. No, it wasn't worse. Okay, then just stay there. Or you can say, wow, great, glad to meet you. Help me. False 
They're not sins. But you've got to deal with them or they'll lead to sins. Burdens are not sin. But you've got to learn to carry them or they'll lead to sin. That's what we're talking about today. I hope this will help you. I hope it, hope it be, be a blessing.